So we're sitting here at the wonderful Vise for Pies, my favorite mm -hmm. restaurant center, and I'm with the amazing uh, Annette Capri, and she's about to tell us a little bit about her story and her journey, and also how she thinks it's important for uh, everyone to preserve records, especially regarding indigenous births and indigenous children, um, because a lot of it's been happening with, the, I guess, sort of the the confrontation regarding residential schools and, and the, the anger which has caused a lot of churches to be lit up. At the same time, vital records of history are being destroyed yeah. simultaneously. So uh, in today's episode, we're going to do a deep dive uh, with Annette on what makes her happy, what she's passionate about, and uh, her life in general. So I was born in Edmonton, Alberta. My grandparents are from Fort Mackay, First Nations. My mother is born across the river in Firebank. I have, there's two sisters and five brothers. So there was seven children my mom had. My grandparents had nine and my great grandparents had 13. We grew up with a pretty much single mother, poverty, urban area back in the 80s. No, well, there's discriminating for us Indigenous people in a municipality, a city where just uh, non-Indigenous people and yeah, stereotyping and a lot of that, you know. So uh, we grew up poor and we always had family coming up from Fort Mackay to visit us and we grew up on the north side of Beverly all our lives, being in school and being one of the few Indigenous people in the area. It was quite the upbringing. We've always had Fort Mackay there. My granny, my grandfather, they would always be on the phone talking to Mackay, see what's going on, keep up to date on the latest things in the community. And a lot of relationships they had there, they were very well respected. We've always maintained that connection to Port Mackay and the family. I started getting more connected when I noticed that my grandparents' name was different. And then it opened up the whole chapter of searching and researching my roots, found out the name changes from our indigenous Indian name, how we became campries and well-known in Fort McMurray as cookies the Cookie family. They couldn't pronounce Okagi, <laughs> so they called him Cookie. And he's like, I think that's what they call me is Cookie, so I'll we'll just go with that. And that's what he did. And that's how my grandparents became the Cookies and my mom, the family. Back in 94, when I got my treaty card and I applied for my children, and then it was denied and I didn't understand why. I went into INAC and I saw my grandparents' last name as Capri, and you just know your family. I had to search for birth documents, and that became the trail, talking to elders that aren't here anymore. I've spoken to so many, searching church records, death records, listening to those stories. Those stories are very valuable because that's who we are today. And if you know those stories, you can find the paper trail to support them. And I guess that's why oral history is vitally important to our people. We've always remained a very close family, even with cousins, our first cousins were raised in our family like siblings also. So we've always had that close kin connection. It's still maintained in our family today with my children. I have seven, six, are mine, range from 37 to 19. And then I adopted one, I'm raising two now at the moment, and in the process of adopting those two girls. And then I had raised all in total about 19 kids through my life. I'm not fostering, I've never been a foster parent, but I've been a kinship provider, so you don't get those extra benefits as a foster parent. I just do it because that's how my ancestors rolled. They've taken children when they died, their parents died, they brought them in and they raised them that way. That's part of our identity and who Indigenous people are. We would raise our family or, or non-family as our own if the parent couldn't. So 
That's why I do what I do. They're denied treaty because my grandfather was enfranchised. An enfranchment is under the Indian Act is a Section D category, which means he was involuntarily taken out of treaty. And there's a process to do that. They have to be able to sustain themselves, which I don't see how my grandfather did because they were living in Moccasin Flat and his rent was like $15 a month and he worked for Northern Transportation and he still maintained his trapping. So part of the infringement was the Indian agent takes them out. They believe they do them a favor and they remove them from their treaty. Back in 1985 when Bill C-31 came in, these were full-blooded Indigenous people and families and children that were taken out were brought back in. It's never been amended until recently they passed the second reading, and it's going to be amended and made up to par with Bill C-31, so my children will finally get their treaty rights. I have wonderful older kids that support me a lot and help me because if it wasn't for them, then going back to school and learning my language, learning why things happened the way it happened and a better perspective when it came to residential school who my mom was to changing identities which happened to us to everything that has happened in the history gives me a better perspective today on